So let's come back to agenda item 5A, Lessons Learned from Health 2020 Implementation, which we interrupted yesterday afternoon. And I would like to suggest that we continue today summarizing the key messages. Let me remind you that the relevant documents are AUR slash RC 69 slash 11 1, AUR slash RC 69 slash 11 Rev 1, AUR slash RC 69 slash InfDoc slash 8, and AUR slash RC 69 slash conf document slash 10 rev 1. I would like to invite you to view a Voices of the Region film, illustrating why everyone should have access to such integrated services that support health equity in order to flourish in life and in health. Can we have the video, please? I me mi je Mirjan. Uh, Prihajam iz Maribora, Štajerske. Živim trenutno v bivanski skupnosti Ozara, v Novi Gorici. Hobi so pravzaprav ukvarjene z bistvenimi stvarmi življenja. In drugače hodim na razne delavnice, potem tudi gremo dosti krat na kakšne izlete z skupnosti Ozara, tako da imamo predvsem zelo pestro življenje. Ja, je bila prva diagnoza, je bila začetek šizofrenije. Ja. Kasneje pa se je spremenila psihoza. Pri 26, 25 letih se mi je stanje prvič poslabšalo in potem sem imel obdobje zelo težkega časa. Letu 2001 sem bil upokojen. In počasi sem začel odpravljati te razne probleme in te in počasi se mi je zdravstveno stanje s pomočjo mentorjev, ki so dali res veliki delež k temu razumevanju in vsega tega, ne. Za aktivnosti Centra krepitve zdravja sem zvedel od naših mentorjev ozare, ki nam tudi vsekako pomagajo vsakemu po svoji zmožnostih in po potrebah, kakorkoli kdo pač potrebuje pomoč. In smo imeli delavnico najprej o prehrani, kasneje smo pa imeli delavnico o tesnobi. Z nami v stik v tej delavnici je bila medicinska sestra, potem dietolog, terapeut, telovadni in psiholog. Lepo je videti, da se nekdo potrudi s tabo, da ima veselje, da ti hoče pomagati na nek način, da spozna sebe, svet in ljudi in vse tako, kot bi bilo za tebe in za druge najboljše. Zelo pomembno je, da so dostopni vsem, kaj ti ljudje so na različnih nivojih materialnih možnosti, na različnih nivojih dela, 
in je pač vsak na svojem področju potrebuje pomoč. In mi je pomagalo vse te soodvisnosti, vse te srečanje, vse to in tudi nova poznanstva in to, da lahko sem začel tudi na tem področju v neki celosti, v realnem življenju funkcionirati zares na en dober način. Now let me give the floor to Chris Brown, head of the WHO European Office for Investment for Health and Development in Venice, Italy, to summarize the key messages of this session. You have the floor. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to pick up from yesterday, and I think uh, the video that we've just seen puts all the work around equity in perspective. It's about real lives. Um, Yesterday, uh, we heard that there are five essential conditions needed to be able to live a healthy life in Europe in the 21st century, and that there is a sliding scale of risk across the population in terms of the opportunities and the security of these essential conditions. And this is what health equity is about addressing. We heard from a wide range of countries on the panel that the policies and programs and services being implemented to reduce health inequalities are ways not only to improve health, but they deliver on broader government and societal goals, such as poverty reduction, social inclusion, social justice, prosperity and well-being, sustainable development, and secure and stable communities. The details of what was shared with us, even though we only had a brief time, uh, included to accelerate action, we need better and new types of data and evidence that will inspire action and focus on solutions, not just describing the problem. That that data and evidence need to be translated into advocacy that shows the real lives to improve and why health inequalities matters, not just to those who are left behind, but for the whole of society. The countries showed that there really is a need to model the direct and the indirect impacts of health inequalities on society and the economy and the benefits of closing those health gaps. And that real progress to uh, reduce inequities can come from strengthening the way that we design policies and services, building on the lived experiencing and show it, showing that uh, and building on the knowledge of those who are left behind to help inform the design and implementation of policies. And given the sliding scale of inequities and risk of falling behind, it's really essential to implement proportionate universal policies. We heard from across the panel the wide range of levers that they were using to make sure that this was mainstream, not just an add-on, that it was core to practice, not just a small project. And they included things like laws, training, incentivizing pro-equity behavior from the private sector, joint planning and delivery with other sectors inside and outside of government, and including social economy and NGOs as partners. Probably I would sum up by saying that what we heard is that there's a huge groundswell of action uh, around tackling health inequalities, and there are different ways that we can do this to make a real life, real lives better. But we in the health sector have to champion it. We have to champion it in the way that we design our local services, in the way that we develop, implement and monitor our regional and national policies. And we have to take that to the decision-making fora at European and global levels to be able to create the enabling conditions for real lives for everybody to be improved. Thank you. Thank you. And now I open the floor for discussion. Delegates wishing to speak on the issues, please raise the name plates. I see Bulgaria. Bulgaria, please. Thank you. Madam Regional Director, dear Chair, distinguished delegates. Bulgaria aligns itself with the report, and it's an honor to share with you the progress for equity in health our country has made. 
in the context of Health 2020 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development towards leaving no one behind in the WHO European region. The concept of health equity is a key element in the development of human capital and well-being has become increasingly important and its principles have been enshrined in a number of international policy documents that Bulgaria has adopted and endorsed. Many of them have become part of the Bulgarian legislation, which is in compliance with the EU legislation. Many issues aimed at promoting health equity and improving the health and well-being of all socio-demographic groups can be found in our policy papers, such as the National Health Strategy 2020, the National Programme for Prevention of Non-Communicable Diseases 2040-2020, the National Poverty Reduction Strategy and Promotion of Social Inclusion 2020, National Programme for Improving Maternal and Child Health 2040-2020, the Health Act, the Social Assistance Act, the National Development Programme 2020, etc. A number of policy documents also address the health aspects of the problems of specific groups of the Bulgarian population, the disabled, the unemployed, the Roma community, as well as health-specific issues, gender equality, healthy aging, health and safety at work, etc. Diverse activities have been funded to improve the quality of life of people in Bulgaria through ensuring early diagnosis, modern treatment of oncological diseases, for example, supporting the development of the system of emergency medical care, providing specialized health and social care for children with disabilities, increasing the level of knowledge, skills, and motivation for a healthy lifestyle, ensuring a network of services for the elderly and the disabled. Another example of good practice in Bulgaria is the creation of a national network of health mediators, which brings together over 200 members, trained and certified by medical universities and the Ministry of Health. The aim of health mediators' activities is to overcome the difficult access of vulnerable minority groups to the healthcare system when these difficulties are related to insufficient communication between health and sometimes social services and patients, or lack of information regarding disease prevention, family planning, and so on. Health mediators work among vulnerable communities with different risk groups. They are fluent in the target language and know the health and social legislation. They are also aware of the specific problems of the community in which they live and work. They have established good partnerships with the local health and social institutions, regional health inspections, medical professionals, and social centers working in the community. The above-mentioned initiatives and practices demonstrate the long-term commitment of Bulgaria to the issues of health equity. We are on the right way. Finally, Madam Regional Director, I would like to extend our government's gratitude to the WHO for its continuous guidance, expert, and technical support provided in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Bulgaria. United Kingdom, please, followed by France. Thank you. The UK is committed to tackling health inequalities, and as such, we have always been supportive of the underlying principles of equitable improvement contained in Health 2020. We as we know all our fellow member states do, view our nation's health and national health system as an asset to be protected. Therefore, earlier this year, our government set out their vision in the long-term plan to prepare our national health service for the future in a time of great change, nationally and, of course, globally. Central to this plan's vision are commitments to support an integrated, people-centred approach to care leading to a reduction in inequalities. These include the use of improved data to better identify health inequalities and unmet need. Using this assessment to develop specific measurable goals for narrowing inequalities, giving all parties an aim to work towards together. 
And a condition for all major national programs receiving funding going forward is to lay out how they will contribute to narrowing health inequalities over the next five to ten years. These commitments demonstrate a concerted, systematic and multi-sectoral approach to reducing health inequalities, as is called for in Health 2020. They're firmly based in evidence that can be adopted locally to improve equity of access and outcomes, overall ensuring that all people live healthier, more independent lives for longer, leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. France, please, followed by Switzerland. Madame la Directrice Générale, Monsieur le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs, euh, donc la France voulait remercier le Bureau Régional pour son rapport sur l'accélération des progrès en matière d'équité de santé dans la région européenne de l'OMS Euro. Euh, D'importantes inégalités, on l'a beaucoup dit, persistent entre et au sein des pays, liées aux inégalités de genre, conditions géographiques, sociales, environnementales et sanitaires dans lesquelles les gens naissent, vivent, travaillent et vieillissent. Effectivement, face à ces enjeux, le renforcement des soins de santé primaire est crucial et c'est ce qu'on a voulu ra rappeler de façon très très forte euh, lors du, du G7 dont nous avons eu la présidence, de même que le rôle essentiel de la littératie en santé qui permet vraiment de, de renforcer le pouvoir d'agir des citoyens, comme l'a si bien rappelé effectivement notre directeur général. Euh, alors, promouvoir l'équité en, en santé est vraiment central pour atteindre la couverture santé universelle et les objectifs du développement durable, mais c'est aussi euh, s'engager dans l'élimination des trois pandémies que sont le sida, la tuberculose et le paludisme. Et je souhaitais profiter effectivement de cette assemblée pour, euh, pour vous re-rappeler effectivement que la sixième conférence de reconstitution des ressources du Fonds mondial se tiendra dans trois semaines à Lyon et il est crucial de poursuivre cette mobilisation de lutte contre les pandémies pour dépasser la cible des 6 milliards et je sais qu'on peut compter effectivement sur votre engagement puisque c'est une contribution essentielle effectivement à la lutte contre les inégalités. Alors dans ce contexte, je voudrais donc réaffirmer au nom de la France le plein soutien qu'on a à la démarche intégrée que vous portez au niveau du bureau régional de l'OMS et peut-être nous encourager collectivement à nous investir dans la lutte contre les inégalités en santé en adoptant les résolutions y afférentes qui sont proposées aujourd'hui sur l'équité en santé, sur le renforcement des soins primaires et la promotion de la littératie en santé, puisque nous pensons effectivement que l'ensemble doit être intégré et mené de pair. Je vous remercie. Thank you, France. Switzerland, please, followed by Spain. Madame la directrice régionale, Monsieur le Président, la Suisse vous remercie d'avoir consulté les États membres en vue d'une accélération des progrès pour assurer une vie prospère et en bonne santé dans la région européenne de l'OMS. Veillez à ce que les systèmes de santé ne contribuent pas à l'iniquité en matière d'accès aux soins est primordial. Dans ce contexte, l'intervention sur les déterminants pouvant induire des iniquités est une approche prometteuse. Malgré cela, et comme vous l'avez mis en avant dans votre rapport, les défis sont complexes. Afin d'y remédier, la Suisse plaide pour une collaboration plus étroite du bureau régional avec d'autres réseaux européens, et ce dans l'objectif de travailler à l'identification d'indicateurs de l'équité dans les soins, à leur construction au vu des particularités nationales, et de réaliser à court terme leur monitoring. À nos yeux, une telle approche mettrait les systèmes de santé et de prise en charge des patients au cœur des réflexions sur l'équité. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Switzerland. Spain, please, followed by Austria. Thank you, Chair. Dear colleagues, reducing health inequities is a guiding principle for Spanish health policies and regulation, such as the national public health law. According to this law, Spain is currently building a national public health surveillance network in which the monitoring of inequities and social determinants of health is included. We would also like to highlight the relevance of warranting health equity from the beginning of life and therefore we advocate for further investing in child protection. We appreciate to see a clear and explicit mention to gender equality in the resolution. Our government is fully committed to reduce all kinds of gender-based inequities. Besides, we are actively, besides, 
we are actively sorry working to improve the health results of vulnerable and marginalized population groups, including migrants and minorities. Therefore, we appreciate the call on local governments to participate in the implementation of the resolution. Spain has developed a close collaboration with local governments to implement both the National Strategy for Health Promotion and Prevention and the Spanish Healthy Cities Network. Spain is fully committed to promoting health equity and it is a priority for the Spanish government. We have fully participated in the Joint Action Equity Action and the Ljubljana Conference. Dear Sir, dear colleagues, please allow me to reiterate Spain's commitment to accelerating progress for equity in health and please be assured of our collaboration with the organization to achieve it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Spain. Austria, please, followed by Russian Federation. Sehr geehrte Frau Regionaldirektorin, sehr geehrte Mitglieder des Regionalkomitees, wir danken für die Behandlung dieses äußerst wichtigen Themas der gesundheitlichen Chancengerechtigkeit. Wie in anderen Ländern der europäischen Region gibt es auch in Österreich eine klare empirische Evidenz für gesundheitliche Ungleichheiten. Wir fühlen uns durch den Bericht und Resolutionsentwurf auf unserem bereits seit 2012 eingeschlagenen Weg mit den bereichsübergreifend ausgerichteten Gesundheitszielen Österreich sowie mit der Zielsteuerung Gesundheit bestätigt. Österreich kann auf diesem Weg bereits eine Reihe von Erfolgen verzeichnen, so zum Beispiel das bundesweite Angebot sogenannter frühen Hilfen für Eltern und Kinder in besonders belasteten Situationen, um möglichst vielen Kindern in Österreich einen möglichst guten Start ins Leben zu ermöglichen. Vor dem Hintergrund der mehrjährigen Erfahrung kennen wir die Schwierigkeiten der intersektoralen Arbeit. Wir suchen die WHO um weitere Unterstützung, vor allem auch im Hinblick auf die Erarbeitung von Argumenten, die die Vorteile die des Zuganges verdeutlichen können, wie zum Beispiel Nachweise der Co-Benefits für unterschiedliche Sektoren. Auch Anknüpfungspunkte an neuere ökonomische Modelle wie die Economy of Wellbeing könnten unterstützend sein. Des Weiteren äh, bräuchte es nach wie vor Empfehlungen zu wirksamen intersektoralen Governance-Modellen. Denn eine Hauptschwierigkeit in der Umsetzung sektorenübergreifender Ziele wie der Verbesserung der Chancengerechtigkeit bleibt die ressortgebundene Zuständigkeit für einzelne Themen. An dieser Stelle möchten wir ausdrücklich den Vorschlag von Impact Assessments begrüßen, da dadurch die erforderliche Bewusstseinsbildung und Handlungsbereitschaft bei Entscheidungsträgern auch in anderen Ressorts gefördert werden kann. Mit Hinblick auf die vorgeschlagene Health Equity Alliance sollte diese nicht allein auf Wissenschaftler und Wissenschaftlerinnen bzw. auf die Expertenebene begrenzt sein. Das MPOL-Netzwerk hat im Bereich Gesundheitskompetenz aufgezeigt, dass es für Allianzen sehr effektiv ist, von Anfang an eine gemeinsame Entwicklungsarbeit von Forschung, Politik und Verwaltung anzustreben. Damit wird die Wahrscheinlichkeit erhöht, dass die von Forschungsseite erarbeiteten Empfehlungen an die Politik tatsächlich gehört, mitgetragen und auch umgesetzt werden. Abschließend möchten wir noch einmal für die Organisation der Konferenz in Ljubljana danken, und den vorliegenden Resolutionsentwurf unterstützen. Danke. Thank you, Austria. Russian Federation, please. Спасибо, господин председатель. Российская Федерация приветствует усилия организации по ускорению прогресса в обеспечении справедливости в отношении здоровья и принятие Люблянского заявления на региональной конференции высокого уровня. Как отмечено в докладе секретариата, барьером для принятия необходимых государственных мер служат недостаточное понимание и осознание причин и источников несправедливости. Реализация европейской политики здоровья 2020, в основу которой был положен принцип справедливости в отношении здоровья, разработанные руководства и инструменты, проведенные исследования и рабочие мероприятия, позволили в значительной степени сократить этот информационный дефицит. В 
целях максимального эффективного решения задач справедливого доступа в рамках уже действующей концепции всеобщего охвата услугами здравоохранения в России в настоящее время реализуется 10 целевых проектов в области здравоохранения, по завершении которых мы готовы будем поделиться своим опытом. Российская Федерация поддерживает доклад и принятие данной резолюции. Спасибо. Albania, please. Honorable Chair, distinguished delegates, special thanks go to the Secretariat for the preparation of the chronologically and logically well-constructed report Health 2020, seven years old. Health 2020 has become undoubtedly the trademark of WHO Euro. It contains the wider concept of health structured into region-wide policy that became mainstream. Health 2020 challenged policymakers at the country level to think systematically out of the box and act beyond the traditional medical and health boundaries. We are all testimonies of the gradual acceptance of the whole of government, whole of society and health in all policies approach up to health as a political choice. The degree of implementation of this approach must be variable and that needs to be assessed, but all agree that this is the way to go. Many were concerned about the reason to be of Health 2020 as SDGs went into force. But now it's clear that Health 2020 vision, principles, values, approaches and priority areas were totally compatible with SDGs and in fact preceded them in a way that gave a clear advantage to WHO European region. Health 2020 puts a clear emphasis on inequalities. All Health 2020 progress reports contain analyses that reflect inequalities in health and the respective gains and loses. The reporting requirements changed and countries adopted another way of presenting the data. It is clear that translating the goodwill into policy and the policy into action is not an easy exercise. Know-how and experience is needed. This is where WHO technical assistance come into play. Much is done more needs to be done. In this regard, we welcome the WHO European Health Equity Status Report Initiative, suite of tools that includes 51 policies and 35 interventions approaches that can be easily incorporated into the design and delivery of services and programs. The Government of Albania developed the National Health Strategy 2016-2020 uh, based on Health 2020 principles and priority areas. The Ministry of Health and Social Protection of Albania approached WHO to, be, to do a full review of the implementation of the national strategy through the lenses of Health 2020, SDGs and the NCD Global Monitoring Framework. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Albania. Hungary, please. Thank you very much, dear Deputy Director General, Regional Director, Directors, Distinguished Ministers, delegates and colleagues. It is my great honor to share with you my experience on the policy dialogue which has been going on between the WHO Region Office of Europe and the Ministry of Human Capacities on the issue of social determinants of health and health inequalities in Hungary. This idea about this policy dialogue came by around 2017 and from then on there were several discussions to high two-level personal meetings which helped to have the product which was a very nice dialogue of policy brief paper on social determinants of health that has been negotiated and presented in a few months ago. In addition to that, that this is a policy dialogue report, we also established a task force, an intersectorial task force within our ministry, and we set that up to go on and move on from this report and act upon it. The policy brief paper summarized the states, the trends in Hungary, and illustrates the measures we have taken so far and encompasses chapters which deal with interventions concerning, among other life course, working years, communities, housing, equitable and sustainable health services, intersectorial and cross-ministry work. During this policy dialogue, it became very clear that the health challenges identified by the WHO as key issues are in line with the health priorities of the Hungarian government and with the strategic direction of actions and measures taken forward to address these priorities. 
all of our discussions led us to believe that in this kind of work between a member states and the WHO regional office, it's a very useful way to approach this people-centered steps towards more health and better health care. And we believe that by this process, that could be a good flagship program, really, which we see now that it's a fruitful way of communication between the office and the member states. We are very grateful for this experience, and we're looking forward to working in such a manner. Thank you very much. Thank you. As I see no more member states asking for the floor, I have to give the floor now to observers. There are several organizations wishing to speak. Permit me, please, to remember to keep the statement in the minutes <laughs> that we have decided. And let's start with Mrs. Elizabeth Lorraine Lichtenstein, who is going to give us a joint statement of many organizations, MWHIA, EUFA, EFAD, WFOT, COTEC, IAH, PCH, TUF, AIDS and IAHPC. I'm sure that you understand as I did. <laughs> so, please have the floor. Thank you very much. My name is Elizabeth Lichtenstein and I'm a representative of Medical Women's International Association. And I have a statement that has been co-signed with these uh, abbreviations which I think I can clarify afterwards. Um, the Medical Women's International Association wish to make the following statement on promoting health equity at the 69th session of the World Health Organization, WHO, Regional Committee for Europe. Health equity, according to WHO definition, is the absence of avoidable, unfair or remediable differences among groups of people whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically or geographically, or by other means of stratification. This implies that ideally everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their whole, full health potential and that no one should be disadvantaged from achieving the potential. Women live longer but spend fewer years in good health. We do know that all over the world women suffer less health than men and often receive suboptimal treatment because of their sex. One of the biggest killers, as we heard yesterday, in modern society today is pregnancy, where women suffer illness and sometimes even death due to inadequate health care. It is not rocket science to avoid complications and mortality during pregnancy and maternity care. It is about resources. In patient approach and treatment of illnesses, there is often an inequity due to gender bias, when it comes to research within medicine, there is a definite gender bias, which is a disadvantage to both men and women. This bias is bad for both men and women in all fields, but is of extra importance when it comes to healthcare and medicine, as these are our fundaments for treating patients and populations. To attain health equity, we have to look beyond these biases and incorporate into every decision all research and all medical treatment a gender perspective. Women all over the world are subject to sexual violence and harassment. WHO reports uh, that one out of three women has suffered some form of violence in their lifetime. Not only are sexually developed adolescents and women, but also children subject to violations. For example, female genital mutilations, even in Europe. This is in direct conflict with the concept of gender equity and is also a violation against basic human rights. Women are strongly underrepresented within leadership in health. Global health is led by men but performed by women. 
Women do much of the caregiving within families, and even older women often take care of their partners in illness due to lack of resources. This becomes even more eminent when it comes to palliative care. To take in accordance women active in health issues, these have to be incorporated in committees and given leading positions as to be able to work for gender equity. MWA proposes to WHO that a gender perspective should be applied within all fields of medicine and research. MWIA proposes to WHO to take an active role to include women leaders in health. MWIA proposes to WHO to take an active role in eliminating avoidable deaths due to gender differences where possible, especially those deaths, deaths easily avoidable in reproductive health. MWIA proposes to WHO to ensure that girls all over the world do not become subjects to sexual violence or harassment and such practices as female genital mutilation to be condemned. MWIA proposes that WHO works to ensure that all committees and executive boards within health and medicine have equal representation of both women and men and diversity as to ensure an optimal culture on working towards increased health and wellness globally. I will not read my references, but I will uh, uh, the, decipher these abbreviations heard before. It's uh, besides the MWIA, which is the Medical Women's International Association, this has been signed by the European Public Health Association, the European Federation of Associ Associations of Dietitians, World Federa Federation of Ocup Occupational Therapists, and the Council of Occupational Therapists for the European Countries, International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, Age Platform Europe, and the Network Towards Unity for Health. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I give the floor to Dr. Julie Link for a joint statement of Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance and International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. Ah, there, here I am. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here representing the World Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance, which is calling upon the WHO Europe and member states to acknowledge and address the major in inequity in access to palliative care services across Europe and the fact that millions of people suffering from serious conditions are being left behind. The need for palliative care will affect all of us. Indeed, it's the one certainty in life that we will all die. Um, yet it's a topic that few of us wish to discuss. For that reason, policy development, budgeting and implementation of need and essential palliative care services have been an inadequate and slow. The result is that millions of people continue to suffer. Those who are marginalised or vulnerable, such as children and older people, as well as people with disabilities, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender populations, prisoners, sex workers and drug users are even more unlikely to be able to access palliative care services. Inequity in access to quality palliative care is a serious problem both European countries and across the globe are experiencing. WHPCA requests that WHO Europe supports member states to understand and act on the serious inequities related to palliative care access to ensure that guidance provided to member states on policy options for universal and targeted policies, both within the health sector and intersectorally, includes adequate focus on the huge inequities in palliative care, and also to ensure that palliative care experts are included in the multidisciplinary health equity alliance of scientific experts and institutions being developed to implement this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Euro Health Net. You have the floor. Thank you, Executive President. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Euro Health Net, not a complicated acronym, 
the European Partnership for Health, Equity and Wellbeing strongly welcomes the Health Equity Status Report and the draft resolution accelerating progress towards healthy, prosperous lives for all, increasing equity and health and leaving no one behind in the European region. And we congratulate the WHO Regional Office and member states responsible for organising the conference held in Ljubljana in June, in which many of our members and our office were pleased to participate and contribute. The resolution's request to place health equity at the centre of sustainable development and inclusive economies offers potentially vital progress. We welcome its call for organisation and partnerships such as ours to engage in and support its implementation. We will absolutely do whatever we can. But in order to do so most effectively, we make a respectful request to you in turn that true partnership working should be better understood and better practiced by all international and national bodies. All the evidence we've seen shows that effective involvement of all affected stakeholders at all stages and all levels, including design, initiation and evaluation of actions, as well as just implementation, needs to be intrinsic, not tokenistic. That means better involving dynamic subnational and civil society bodies who have so much potential to help if they are valued and their capacities are enhanced. We and others can be a crucial part of these solutions. No international organisation, state or stakeholder can achieve complex, challenging but vital objectives alone. This is why progress has been variable and slow in part. Of course, that's in addition to common wider problems of tackling symptoms rather than underlying causes of inequities, as Professor Sir Michael Marmot has so vividly demonstrated, including here yesterday. That can and must change. Your HealthNet's mission has prioritised health and social equity within and between European countries for two decades. We shall seek to continue to contribute to the work and objectives of WHO globally and regionally, plus all its member states, as is appropriate. We'll also continue to advise the institutions and programmes of the European Union, as it reaches now an important landmark of a decade since publication of the communication Solidarity in Health on Tackling Health Inequalities. We already support the EU Joint Action Jahi, and we are reinvigorating how online portal to update on new initiatives where we're working with many people in this room and building as part of the WHO Europe coalition and partners. Our website includes links to our work and yours from research outcomes to practice models and examples to policy recommendations and we shall obviously add on the new evidence brought forward this week. They will support this important resolution's call and its aim to accelerate the slow progress to overcome the persistent inequities in health and its determinants, which blight and damage all of our systems, all of our countries, all of our communities. As Sir Michael Mummer has long said, we know enough to act now, and we are ready, willing and able to help play our active part. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Medicus Mundi International, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. The statement by Medicus Mundi International is supported by People's Health Movement. We appreciate the regional committee keeping health equity, a core issue of global health, high on its agenda. The Ljubljana statement on health equity explicitly acknowledges the role austerity measures play in widening inequities. We would like to see this reflected more in the draft resolution. However, the focus here is mainly on generating cutting-edge evidence and methods. We have had a lot of evidence for a while now. What we are missing is more action. Member states should act on the evidence now reinforced through the European Health Equity Status Report and steer away from the neoliberal policies which enhance inequity in health. We call upon the regional policy, uh, sorry, we call upon the regional committee to support and lead member states in this by returning to the vision of the declaration of Alma-Ata, where resources are fairly distributed within and between countries. Health equity can only be achieved through dedication to the orig original idea of health for all. This includes health system sailor on needs, where rather than halfway solutions for reducing public expenditure in, in other sectors through selective investments in healthcare. It is commendable that the resolution offers practical guidance for a health in all policies approach. If tailored to protect health against economic interests, 
This could indeed help alleviate health inequities in the region. Lastly, a true commitment to health equity should mean that the health of those already left behind, including refugees and migrants, are a clear priority. We therefore urge member states to take a bolder stand in their future action on health equity, ensuring that they are led by the commitment to realizing a just world. Thank you. We thank you. And now the World Organization of Family Doctors, please. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I'm Dr. Ungan, President of the World Organization of Family Doctors in Europe, and uh, will share a statement on equity for a better quality of care for all students of the WHO region, Europe. May I draw your attention to one of the 20 principles and rights proclaimed by the European Commission in 2017. Everyone has the right to timely access to affordable, preventive and curative health care of good quality. Wonka Europe in 2018 conference, there was a statement. It says, equity in health care is an essential dimension of quality of health care. Equitable health care is hereby considered as health care in which the access to care, treatment and outcome of care do not vary according to the any patient characteristics different than his, her health needs. Our quality network members scientifically explored, found the evidences, many issues in primary health care. Depending on research evidence in primary health care services, it became obvious that equity should be one of the core principles determining, planning, organization, behavior of practice in primary health care. Family doctors from 48 countries of the Wonka Europe and non-state actors of primary health care professionals shared the WHO's position that countries should build universal health care systems with a strong foundation of primary health care. This will prepare the ground for efficient multi-sectoral actions committed to deliver high-quality health care. We are all aware that actions must be focused on several areas simultaneously. We are strongly emphasizing the delivery of primary health care services should focus the available resources on patient and community needs. Thank you. Thank you. And now the Standing Committee of European Doctors, please. Thank you, Chair. The Standing Committee of European Doctors uh, representing 1.7 million doctors across Europe, welcomes the opportunity to comment on the report promoting health equity in the European Union uh, region at the 69th session of the WHO Regional Committee for Europe. European doctors remain committed to tackling avoidable health inequalities. The CPME continuously highlights the impact of health equity in all relevant policies at EU and national level, including in the context of climate change, migration, and economic policies. In terms of climate change, CPME seeks out opportunities to highlight the impact of policy decisions on health and inequalities on different population groups. For example, we comment on EU-level policies on climate change and pollution, in terms of employment, we have often highlighted the impact of employment conditions on health, both as a stressor, stressor and a potential protective factor. This includes, obviously, mental health. Precarious employment, which may arise especially from new forms of work, such as zero-hour contracts, are definite risk factors for health and must be treated accordingly. In terms of economics and finance, the CPME has commented on general economic and fiscal policies, for example, in the context of the austerity programs developed for Cyprus and Greece. We highlighted that the austerity programs exacerbated health inequalities and created new vulnerable groups of patients. We call for awareness of the health effects of policy decisions on education, housing, pensions, transport, energy, personal finance, and environment. There's still urgent need for improvement, 
The CPME welcomes WHO Europe's effort to accelerate the process for equity and health and will continue to support all efforts towards this objective. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the International Federation of Medical Students Association, please. Thank you. The International Federation of Medical Students Associations applauds the efforts and initiatives taken by the WHO European Region Member States to achieve the sustainable and equitable world we all envision and truly leave no one behind. Although progress has been made, we are still witnessing significant health disparities within and between our countries that undermine the equity we are trying to achieve. The IFMSA calls on member states and non-state actors to create mechanisms to measure the magnitude of health inequalities within and among countries, identifying the people and populations affected by these inequities and analyzing their roots. Secondly, we consider there is a lack of investment that supports the need for further research on improving health systems, taking in consideration the social determinants of health that influence a given population. Finally, with the 2030 Agenda, the world community reaffirmed its commitment to sustainable development. Therefore, IFMSA calls on member states to develop inclusive policies focused on all people in need and deprivation, aimed at leaving no one behind, in a manner which targets their specific challenges and vulnerabilities, analyzing their impact and progress in communities as they are implemented. Only through meaningful involvement, interprofessional collaboration, and a strong global commitment to health equity can we truly sustain equitable growth and create more fair, inclusive, and prosperous communities. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Regions for Health, please. Hello. My name is Camilla Ilbeck, and I'm here representing the WHO Region for Health Network. The Region for Health Network is supporting the implementation of WHO policies at the subnational level. In the fast-changing European context, we, the regions, are vitally important. Subnational regions act as bridges between national ambitions and local delivery. Many regions have significant political and administrative functions and responsibilities uh, in matters that are important for health. Regions are also facilitators, catalysts, and advocates of the right to the highest level of health for all. We acknowledge the finding of the Health Equity Status Report. It is clear that regions and cities have an important role to play in reducing health inequalities. The WHO Healthy City Network and the Region for Health Network presented the joint statement at the high-level conference of health equity held in Ljubljana in June this year. The statement emphasized the leading roles of municipalities, cities and subnational regions as advocates for equity in health, ensuring that the focus on equity in health withstands fluctuating social, cultural and political changes. We are convinced that the Health Equity Status Report and the proposed resolution will serve as an impetus for enhanced engagements, collaboration and action on equity for health in all our regions, cities and countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we can consider adoption of the proposed draft resolution contained in AUR slash RC69 slash Confidential document slash 10 Rev 1. Draft resolution on accelerating progress towards healthy, prosperous lives for all in the WHO European region. Is the committee willing to adopt the proposed draft resolution by consensus? I see no objection. The resolution is therefore adopted. And now, let's proceed to lessons learned from Health 2020 implementation. 
Health 2020, Leadership in Public Health in the WHO European Region, and Lessons Learned from Seven Years of Implementation. EUR slash RC69 slash 15, EUR slash RC69 slash 17, and EUR slash RC69 slash conf document slash 11. We focus on the lessons learned for implementing Health 2020. This will be introduced by the Regional Director, followed by a panel discussion and then the debate of the committee, including on the resolution. The relevant documents are EUR slash RC69 slash 15, EUR slash RC69 slash 17 and EUR slash RC69 slash confidential document slash 11. In, a, in adopting and implementing Health 2020, European Member States put in place principles and systems that reflect the cross-cutting nature of health and well-being. It ensured that our region is well prepared for the breadth and complexities of the Sustainable Development Goals SDGs. Facing challenges such as large-scale migration, global emergencies, aging populations, persistent health inequalities, energy security and climate change concerns, and the need to implement universal health coverage, equitable financial protection, and so forth, even greater efforts will need to achieve the vision, goals and targets of the 2030 Agenda. This committee adopted a roadmap to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to assist Member States. Health 2020 was designed as a guiding framework, analyzing the ways in which Member States interpreted this framework and adapted it to their national contexts, along with practical example, and is valuable. I would like now to give the floor to the Regional Director, Dr. Susanna Jakob, to give an introductory presentation for this very, very important topic. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Executive President, dear colleagues, dear friends. I will be very short this time, because the most important issues that I wanted to highlight in connection with the progress with Health 2020 over the last two, uh, 10 years, were already included in my main presentation of yesterday. So I don't want to repeat what I said at this time. But I would like to emphasize a few points where I see the importance and the role of Health 2020 over this period of time to improve health, to reduce inequities, and to improve the governance of health. We have achieved quite a lot to improve indicators, and, and we went through that yesterday, so I don't want to repeat that. Where we have not achieved as much as we have foreseen 10 years ago is in the area of equity in health, although there has been progress in many areas, and you reviewed that in the previous session and also during the uh, recent Ljubljana conference. But obviously, the inequities still scar the European region, as it is also a global scar on the public health agenda. So it is not relevant only to the European region. And therefore, this will be an area of work where you have to continue uh, to pursue all the agreed policies and strategies in the years to come. But now that uh, 10 years is coming to an end, it is also a good time what has been achieved with the Health 2020 and how it should live on in our um, uh, policy agenda. And I can say that quite a lot has been achieved because we have pushed forward with the value-driven policies in the region and the values have been pretty much, and the main guiding principles, they have been pretty much integrated into national policies. We have also made efforts in the regional office 
to align all the related strategies and action plans with Health 2020, and also the conferences that we have organized over the last 10 years were aligned with this policy framework. I am also very proud to say that the evidence base of Health 2020 has been very well developed, and actually we started the work there with Professor Marmot on the social determinant study you heard that yesterday, with Ilona Kikbush on several of the governance studies, actually Ilona and, and her team developed two. Then the European Observatory also developed a study on the health in all policies. Then we have developed additional work on the economic context and the economic implications of health and health 2020 on overall development. So a lot has been done to pursue with the evidence base, and this is very valuable. We have also made good progress, but not enough probably, with the intersectoral way of working, both at the regional level and also at the national level. And I hope that some of you who have aligned your national policies with the Health 2020 framework will share your national experience in this regard. But one area where we have to pursue the work is the intersectoral governance and also the multi-stakeholder alignment to make progress also on our multi-determinant approach. And to address all the determinants of health, the so-called multi-determinant approach, that has been going on quite well and it has to continue. We have not done enough in some areas like the commercial determinants or the cultural determinants. We address mainly the environmental determinants, the social determinants quite a lot in our work, and also the four risk factors, the behavioral risk factors uh, that are so important for the NCD response. But there are determinants that are not addressed enough. We also have to pursue the work on, on prevention and health promotion as a very important component of public health, health protection as well and also to look at the healthcare financing, how we can invest more into prevention and health promotion activities. We have done quite a lot on the networks. I think that's one of the areas that we can be really proud of. Networks like the setting networks, healthy cities, health promoting schools, the region for health networks, not to mention then the small countries network that is so valuable and it's a new initiative then also the Southeast European Health Network that has contributed significantly to our work. But there are still uh, more networks to come, like my dream has always been uh, to put in motion the healthy workplaces, also through that to reach out to the corporate sector more, which we have not really pursued as much as we could have or should have because of lack of capacity. So just to flag up one area where even in the networks we can move further, we have developed quite a good implementation package, and I'm sure that you heard and you will hear more about this, and that helped you when you moved forward with the national policies. And when I was really uh, very um, uh, happy to see uh, the progress in the countries is the alignment of the national policies with the European framework. And you saw the figures also yesterday in my presentation. It was also quite useful to set targets for the Health 2020 and to have at least six headline targets, which was then supplemented with a package of health indicators on the basis of which we followed progress and every three years we reported back to you within the European Public Health Reports. And that was a process that has shown accountability to the targets that we have established globally. And this is the framework that we are promoting also globally. So in the presentation of Samira um, on the um, uh, general program of work and particularly the program budget, you hear, heard many of the elements of this accountability framework. And we will come back to that discussion also later on today. So all in all, a lot has been done, a lot has been achieved. There are still outstanding tasks. But what makes me really happy is that Health 2020 will live on in the SDG agenda and it will live on in the general program of work and it has already influenced in many ways the global development. So I will stop here, Chairman.
and uh, that was my introduction. But I'm very, very interested to hear the opinion of the member states and the feedback and the experience that they want to share with us in this regard. Thank you. Before we open the floor for the debate, I would like to invite Professor Ilona Kikbush, Chair of the International Advisory Board of the Global Health Center, to introduce the panelists and moderate an important debate. Professor Kikbush, you have the floor. Mr. Chairperson, thank you very much. I would like to ask the uh, panelists to please come and join me here. Dr. Paivi Sinilauki from the Permanent Secretary of Ministry of Social Affairs and Health Finland, please. Mr. Enric Lorca Ibanez, City Mayor, City Council of Saint Andrew de la Barca. Dr. Alisha Shadmanov, the Minister of Health from Uzbekistan. And Dr. John Ryan, uh, Director of Public Health from DG Sante. Please come and join me. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, let's start. The intention of this session is to speak to a number of key actors uh, in the European region to hear from them uh, the impact that Health 2020 has had on their work, uh, but even more so a kind of dynamics that has emerged between the work here of the regional office and its member states uh, both at the national level, the local level, and of course the European level with the European Union and the European Commission. At this stage, I would like to ask uh, the ministers and particularly the EU presidency to allow me to break protocol uh, because uh, Mr. Ryan has to catch a plane. This panel is later than originally planned and we do want to hear from the Commission how they have seen this interface of the increasing cooperation between the regional office uh, and the European Commission. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, John, I'd like to ask you to share with us uh, a little bit those elements that have been particularly important over the last 10 years, because that cooperation has increased at the same time each organization moves forward and to some extent, you are again at a critical point in time where, as we talked earlier, the uh, health across policies, if I can call it that, also within the Commission are increasing and being strengthened. So please share with us how that strategy developed seven years ago uh, impacted also on your work and how you were able to strengthen that as well. Please, John. So... Yes, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, ministers. From the Commission's, European Commission's point of view, uh, the first word that springs to mind when we think about the World Health Organization is the word leadership. And I think the uh, Health 2020 document is a leadership document, it's a vision document. But it's not only a vision document, it contained a lot of concrete elements and uh, targets, as we heard earlier on. So it's not a, uh, a wish list, it's uh, a concrete document with concrete ideas. Uh, it was also very strong on consultation, so it was developed jointly also taking account of uh, input from the European Commission. And this led to a recognition that it was a solid piece of work, a solid document. And the Commission in fact has um, incorporated many of the ideas and the approaches proposed by the World Health Organization increasingly in its own internal policy making. So if you want just a single sentence, I think it was successful in that sense, that it managed to 
interact with a policy-making organization, the European Union, and to introduce some of the ideas um, as to how to bring public health more centrally into a policy-making agenda in Europe. <coughs> now, I think since the document has been adopted, the situation has changed also from the political point of view, because it seems to me <clears throat> that with the pressure on health systems to make them more sustainable, often a, a cost-cutting pressure, there is also a, a citizen's recognition that health is an important part of their lives, and a recognition by the commercial sector, the industrial sector, that uh, having healthy workforce is also important. So there are many different angles that you could look at this uh, strategy from. But the key message is that health is now more central in policy making. It is a consideration now in uh, how the European Union considers its policy making agenda. And a good example of that is perhaps the way that there is an interaction between the Health 2020 ideas, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the way that the European Union has been developing policies, um, taking a health um, aspect into account. The European Union is not only committed to helping member states implement the Sustainable Development Goals, but also to do so internally in our own internal policies. And that's a new development. I don't think it would have happened without this push from the WHO and the inspirational nature of some of the documents. <clears throat> it's also um, quite interesting that um, the focus is now turning within the European Commission to implementation. And there again, the WHO has been very effective in identifying best buys and good interventions which are evidence-based. And the European Union, through its legislation, but also through its financial instruments, is trying to support those types of uh, activities. Now, just a final word on the areas of cooperation between the two organizations. I think this has really taken off in the last few years, also based on the agreement which we have in the Vilnius Declaration. And this will, of course, need to be followed up in the years to come to define better our areas of cooperation. But if we think about tobacco, for instance, if we think about health security, if we think about vaccination, where we had a major conference just a few days ago, uh, the work which we did on joint reporting of surveillance data, another concrete example of how the two organizations work, and, and again during the uh, major events of concerning refugees and migrants, so there are many examples, I think, where the organizations are meshing together their, their efforts. And this is all based, of course, on a very solid document on your side, on the side of the WHO. So we look forward to continuing our cooperation with the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe, and also expanding and deepening that cooperation. Thank you, John. It's very interesting to read the mission letter sent uh, to... Uh, the designated health commissioner, and I just want to highlight two things here uh, to which you've already alluded. It says clearly each commissioner will ensue the delivery of the SDGs within their policy area. And that, of course, also gives a basis uh, for the SDG focus uh, and the cooperation with the WHO if everyone is going in that joint direction. And then, you know, this point that you also made, the link between people and their institutions. And as we had discussed earlier, how uh, can the, uh, the trust and uh, the uh, orientation of, of people towards health and well-being, that they feel the institutions contribute to that, actually be strengthened? And that's where I'd like to turn to the presidency. Because, again, you have put that in the center, and you've actually also created uh, or are starting to create a new language around uh, the well-being economy also. And that, again, takes us back to the WHO, which perhaps uh, for a while forgot one of the words in its constitution, because the constitution doesn't speak about health. It speaks about health and well-being. 
And uh, therefore, it would be interesting for us to hear from Finland that's been a trailblazer, really. You know, North Karelia, everyone knows that. Health in all policies, we've all learned from you. Now you're throwing out a new mindset as well. How do you see that interface? A country that's doing a lot, that's a very active member of the World Health Organization. How does that dynamic work out? Did Health 2020 help you with anything? Or were you already ahead? Uh, thank you, Ilona. I would say that, that uh, of course, Health 2020 uh, was helping us. Because uh, health ministries are not the strongest ministries in countries. And, and Finland also went through an um, economical recession then uh, during 1990s. And, and uh, after that, both municipalities, which have been responsible for social and health services, education, uh, and then our government then focused more on, on the power of, of financial sector and financial ministers and financial language took then really really the, uh, the top, uh, top <clears throat> position. And, and uh, we have had a long uh, history, uh, Finland, that, that health Public health and health promotion and primary health care has been part of our, our uh, constitution, uh, that, that uh, people are uh, equal and, and they have right to those services and support they need so that they can uh, live uh, their full potential in our, our society. So that's why, why we have uh, been able to also contribute to that uh, Health 2020 process. Uh, but also uh, it has uh, given us support, as John just said, that it's, it has been, uh, uh, it's always important that, that there are uh, uh, organizations which uh, we uh, really respect, that they are uh, giving evidence and they are neutral. Uh, uh, they are not uh, representing some kind of, of, uh, of uh, party policy. So, uh, that, uh, that we can then rely on, on, on that, that evidence. And uh, I would say that, that uh, the evaluation then, uh, then uh, from uh, uh, the beginning of uh, Health 2020 and also from our previous pres presidency when we, uh, we uh, then presented the, the health in all policies, uh, we have then got uh, 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 United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals which uh, are very familiar for us then to, to uh, have then economical, environmental and uh, social sustainability together there. So it has been easy then to, to uh, uh, then go further and, and during our, uh, our present uh, EU presidency then, uh, then present this uh, economy of well-being. So highlighting really, really that, that uh, what impact health and well-being has then to economy and, uh, on the other hand, vice versa. And uh, as I yesterday said, that, that uh, there has been really a lively discussion uh, w uh, between member states uh, of this and, and there have been concrete examples which we can be uh, driven then from uh, this, uh, this Health 2020. Uh, uh, document also. But I would like to still uh, t take one more thing here, and it's the new technology. It gives us also new tools, and we are highlighting that also during our economy of well-being uh, um, uh, 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 definition, that, that we should take also advantage of new technology and digitalization where we can even more personalized mm -hmm. give also social su uh, support, social security and services. So combine and integrate more, more social uh, and, and health policies and then other policies also. One example, we have been able to uh, halve uh, homelessness in Finland. So here are some points. Thank you very much, and thank you for indicating one area that's going to become more important in the Commission, that's going to be more important for countries and, of course, for the World Health Organization, and that is the digital transformation and how you know, that transformation, how the new technologies, how the new forms of communication 
can really perhaps allow us to accelerate uh, some of the uh, health activities that one has been trying to do. And at the same time, I think the issue of protection of citizens uh, for which uh, the European Union stands uh, with its uh, regulatory approach to uh, some of the health data issues, the large Googles of this world, et cetera, will be very critical. And uh, the regional director alluded to the commercial determinants. And that's not only our usual suspects in alcohol, tobacco, and other areas, but is also a whole range of the technology development, the large uh, information and uh, social media companies. So I think there's a big challenge that one can take up together and that I hope also the uh, new regional director will be able to work on uh, with the Commission, with the European uh, Union uh, presidencies. We have with us the Minister of Health of Uzbekistan, Mr. Shadmanov, and your country is on a really exciting reform path, and in the direction that you are going, you have taken Health 2020 really as a, as a leading star and uh, have tried to show in what way not only health but education and social protection work together from the very start. Can you share with us uh, some of that uh, direction that you're going into and some of the experiences you have made? Please, Mr. Minister, if you would take uh, one of those microphones. Yes, thank you. Спасибо. Благодарю вас. Три года тому назад, когда Республика Узбекистан стояла на пороге реформ в системе здравоохранения, были определенные успехи в нашей системе. Они касались борьбы с инфекционными заболеваниями с малярией, с туберкулезом, с вопросами вакцинации. Но в то же время у нас были большие проблемы по борьбе с неинфекционными заболеваниями. В вопросах общественного здравоохранения, первичной медико-санитарной помощи. И то есть, таким образом, актуальность, необходимость этой реформы была бесспорной. И стал вопрос, с чего же нужно начать? И было решено, и начали с политической воли. Когда президент Республики Узбекистан, президент Мирзияев Шавкат Мироманович, под свою ответственность, под свой контроль и патронаж взял все реформы в системе здравоохранения. И начиная политику открытости, сразу же были определены механизмы парламентского и общественного контроля, которого раньше у нас не было. И мы начали с инвентаризации всей системы здравоохранения Республики Узбекистан. Мы изучили международный опыт и опыт соседей. Более 30 стран с выездом на место мы изучили опыт их реформирования. И после этого мы приступили к разработке концепции, какая у нас должна быть стратегия, по какому пути мы пойдем, какой у нас будет прототип, с чего начнем, какие будут приоритеты. И вот, которая будет подразумевать реформирование всего управления, коренное реформирование финансирования, изменение материально-технической базы и подготовки кадров. И в этом смысле у нас работа велась межсекторально и постоянно под, э, при экспертной поддержке со стороны Всемирной организации здравоохранения. И я могу сказать, когда мы подготовили концепцию, уже на итоговое обсуждение в 2018 году к нам э, приехала делегация во главе э, с госпожой Жужанной Якоб, и мы в Ташкенте обсудили все направления и дали внешнюю оценку. После этого уже цели, задачи были определены, и нужно было знать, какими путями, какими инструментами мы дальше будем двигаться, как будем реализовывать. Для этого значит, были созданы 10 межведомственных э, групп, в которые вошли значит, работники администрации президента, кабинета министров, министерства финансов, министерства экономики и промышленности и других ведомств, членов наших правительств. Эти 10 групп работали над нормативно-правовыми актами, над разработкой механизмов реализации медицинского страхования и цифровизации, 
цифровизация была основой, главным столпом во всем реформировании. И при проведении межсекторальной работы, например, одна группа работала по реформированию финансов финансового управления, финансового менеджмента. Здесь Министерство экономики, Министерство финансов совместно работали. Другая группа э, работала по вопросам, э, значит, например, это касалось э, антибиотикорезистентности. Э, тут э, мы работали, Министерство здравоохранения в лидерстве своем, Работала с Министерством сельского хозяйства и с Комитетом по ветеринарии. Следующее, нам нужно было работать по борьбе с неинфекционными заболеваниями, по вопросам здорового образа жизни, по ограничению применения употребления сахара, соли, алкоголя, табачных изделий, по развитию спорта, по оздоровлению и также по совершенствованию образования и культуры. В этом направлении тоже мы с этими ведомствами вели совместную работу. Еще одна группа работала по ограничению и снижению травматизма. Здесь мы работали с Министерством внутренних дел, с Министерством строительства, дорожного транспорта и с ними вместе. Но в каждом случае по рекомендации ВОЗ было решено, что лидером, Должно быть Министерство здравоохранения, и мы старались это обеспечить. И в итоге мы пришли к выводу, что именно этот путь, когда обязательно, неустанно, на всех этапах присутствует политическая воля, парламентский и общественный контроль, и экспертная поддержка ВОЗ, она вот начала обеспечивать и давать первые результаты. Поэтому... Пользуясь случаем, мы благодарим Всемирную организацию здравоохранения, Европейское региональное бюро и страновой офис за всемирную поддержку проводимых реформ в Республике Узбекистан. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you, Mr. Minister, and thank you for making it so tangible and understandable and giving us a feeling that's really exciting to work like that. Uh, so maybe that's one thing we should underline when we talk about this kind of approach, that rather than staying within one's own ministry and bubble, it's actually quite exciting to go out and work with all the others. Mr. Mayor, just allow me before John has to leave to ask him one more question. Uh, you, uh, we've heard about that intersectoral working, and I'd you know, like to come back to uh, the mission letter that I read and this fascinating initiative that's in that mission letter about from farm to fork, which is also an example of you know, the intersectorality that the Commission has to build within its own work. Could you make some of that tangible for us as well, uh, the way the minister just did that for his country? Yes, so the uh, initiative uh, described as From Farm to Fork is an idea to bring together different strands. You know that a large part of the European Union budget is spent on the common agricultural policy. And uh, at the same time, we have got to make sure that the agricultural policy is future-proofed, is in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. And this draws the conclusion that we should also discuss healthy diets because it, it, there's no use paying public money for products or for production that's not contributing to health. That's not sustainable. So this is also linked, for example, and this will be our intention, to questions around climate change and use of inputs into the agricultural system like pesticides. So what we're trying to do is to have a more holistic approach, I would say, to use a cliche, where we try and bring as many strands as possible into the equation, and that we're not just talking about subsidies for a particular product, but also looking at the more general picture of how that product contributes to sustainability. So it's a fairly ambitious thing, and of course a lot of conflicts of interest mm -hmm. between the different interest groups. Uh, because you have the farming industry, you have the uh, food and drinks industry, which is the biggest employer in Europe. The biggest employer in Europe is the food and drink industry. We often forget that. And then, of course, the consumers. The consumers have their own expectations. 
and not everybody wants to eat healthy food, so there's a whole um, there's a whole trip which has to a whole road which has to be traveled there in communicating with the public and not forcing things on people, but encouraging them to live a healthier lifestyle. And WHO's role there, of course, is central. Thank you very much, John. Mr. May, I'd like to come to you. And uh, of course, we say all of this is about people. And you know, people live in cities in the majority. And uh, the WHO Healthy Cities Project has tried to uh, take that forward from the start. How do we improve health and well-being? And the regional director alluded to the importance of networks also as a strategy for implementation. Could you share with us how Healthy Cities and Health 2020 made a difference for your city and for the network of cities overall? Bonsoir. Le site, grâce à son relation avec le réseau national et le réseau européen des cités avec bonne santé, ont pu mettre leur attention sur les lignes stratégique du programme Santé 2020, quelque chose d'essentiel euh, pour améliorer la santé de nos cités. Nous avons dépassé la conception classique du concept de santé publique fondée sur la prévention, la protection, la promotion de la santé et en incorporant les éléments novateurs avec une approche multidéterminante de la santé, comme par exemple les déterminants sociaux de la santé, l'équité, les déterminants environnementaux de la santé et la relation familiale. Pour mieux atteindre cet objectif, nous avons compris qu'une nouvelle approche du cadre politique est nécessaire pour répondre à l'ensemble des déterminants de la santé, de la santé qui pourvoient une action interdépartementale avec des alliances pour désenvelopper les concepts santé dans toutes les politiques. Euh, pour tout ce que nous avons exposé, il est très nécessaire un leadership euh, politique fort de la promotion de la gouvernance, l'empowerment et la participation des citoyens. Il est également nécessaire de conjuguer que si que précéder avec l'engagement et la stabilité dans le développement des politiques visant à atteindre ces objectifs. Les villes sont comme la paix maître pour la mise en œuvre des mesures définies, car c'est le lieu physique où les citoyens désenvolvent leur vie, étant donné que les autorités municipales sont encore politiques, agents de compétences transversales et donc des possibilités d'action dans différents domaines. Les autorités municipales pouvant façonner la structure de la ville en élaborant les plans d'urbanisme qui déterminent la ville sain et éliminant des obstacles architectes importants. Ainsi, les maîtres pouvant créer des espaces publics dignes qui facilitent les relations entre les citoyens éliminant le ghetto. Programme de euh, sociétés qui luttent contre la inégalité et luttent contre le chômage en allouant des fonds pour lutter contre les euh, pauvreté énergétique. Les villes disposent de outils pour lutter directement contre les déterminants sociaux de la salut, de la santé et pour les anciens qui encouragent la création d'emplois permettant l'accès égal à l'éducation et à la culture. L'élaboration 
de plans de santé municipaux, élément important pour connaître les besoins en matière de santé de la cité. La cité est un élément essentiel pour parvenir à un développement durable grâce à des programmes de mobilité, à la promotion de la efficacité énergétique et des économies d'eau de recyclage des déchets. Tout cela, un espace qui encourage la collaboration de, entre les administrations à l'échange d'expériences en réseau avec d'outils tels que le réseau national ou le réseau européen de les villes sans de l'OMS. La formation d'équipes techniques et la sensibilisation à différents niveaux dans le but de travailler de manière globale à l'élaboration de programmes innovants adaptés à la réalité du moment en tirant parti des possibilités offertes ils présentent. L'élaboration de GIE, indicateur qui permet d'évaluer l'impact sur la santé des actions menées et un instrument essentiel pour mener des actions fondé sur données factuelles. En bref, développer la diplomatie urbaine pour améliorer la santé et le bien-être de citoyens. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for linking so beautifully to the social determinants agenda about which we spoke earlier. We're, of course, under tremendous time pressure, but I'd like to give uh, each of you uh, one sentence in terms of looking into the future. So we're at a very critical point in time. The leadership of the commission is changing. The presidency has changed continuously. Uh, there is uh, the SDG movement. There will be a new leadership here at the, the regional office. And as the governance agenda is taken forward, What would you think will be the really, really critical point to take up? Literally one sentence. Yeah. Uh, partnerships, partnering uh, inside your country, uh, inside your government, with uh, 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 like, like we have in uh, Agenda 2030, we have private sector, uh, civil society, and then governments working together. Go and see what we did in Silver Economy Forum in the beginning of our presidency. We, are, we, we got very positive impact on that and we will continue. That is a big thing. Partnership. Uh, John? So one, one short sentence. I think we should focus on implementation because uh, really I think that's the key to making organizations effective. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Необходимо заострить внимание на цифровизации и интеграции. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor? Politique de pour faire ville plus sain et plus heureuse pour toutes. Thank you very much. So, indications for a future agenda, indications of how useful Health 2020 was, indications of great political commitment uh, that we've heard here at country level, at organizational level, and at city level. So I think we can look optimistically into the future and take forward the governance agenda together. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists.